OK, thanks very much. Uh, so when I wrote this talk, and in particular the title, I wasn't expecting it to be quite so hot. So maybe geometric multigrid without more agonizing pain would be a, a, better, a better title. But here we go. So I've got quite a long time. So I thought I would try and give a very brief introduction and then a multigrid primer, because I don't know how many people in the room know multigrid well. I know lots of people will. Um, but my experience when I first started looking at this is like, initially it all looks very mysterious and you don't really know where to start looking. But it's actually not so bad. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about support for multigrid in FireDrake. Um, so why do we care about multigrid at all, or sort of multi-level methods in general, as Stefano just presented? So large problems need fast and scalable solvers. So if you're doing small problems, you can use direct solvers, and it's all fine, and you're really robust. But as soon as you then switch to doing like a really large problem, suddenly you don't get an answer in a reasonable amount of time. So what do I mean by fast? I mean, I want to be able to achieve an error between my discrete solution and, and the real solution that's less than some tolerance in order n work, where n is the number of degrees of freedom in my problem. What do I mean by scalable? Well, I sort of mean that I don't want to be doing lots of communication. So fast parallel algorithms sort of have order log number of processors, communication depth. And so our solver really wants to have this as well. Um, and so multi-level methods do offer this if you get them right. So a sketch history, and this is a really sketch history because there's only one slide and there's a lot of work in multigrid. So in about the mid-60s, there's a paper by Fedorenko that talks, that sort of analyzes a two-level method for the Pla Laplacian in 1D. And I think people looked at it and they go, oh, but it didn't really help that much. And it was sort of ignored for a while. Um, and then in the 70s, there's an explosion in the development of rigorous analysis and multi-level methods. And a lot of this work is led by Aki Brandt, who was at Technion, I think, um, starting to develop techniques for non-elliptic problems as well. Uh, in the 1980s, Aki, I think, was really pushing multigrid for everything. Um, and so there are two guides to multi-level methods that came out in the 80s. So Aki Brandt's 1984 multigrid guide I think is quite nice, and um, Hackbush, if you really like norms, I think is quite nice. <laughs> if you really like norms, I think it's quite nice, but I find it very, very hard. Um, and so you, they sort of develop all this machinery for using sort of multi-level methods as sort of asymptotic direct solvers, and I'll have a little bit about that. Uh, in the 1990s, um, well, MG, it turns out, for everything is too hard if you're not Aki. <laughs> Um, and so lots of people start using multigrid for sort of preconditioning Krylov. So you just use multigrid to sort of improve the spectrum of your operator and use your Krylov accelerator to sort of fix up any issues you've had in not implementing it quite right and so on. Uh, in the 2000s, lots of people started looking at sort of HDiv and curl curl problems and so on and realized that the standard techniques they were using for elliptic problems in H1 weren't working. So there's a bunch of development on auxiliary space preconditioning for multigrid and like direct preconditioning for multigrid in HDiv and HCurl in the 2000s. And these days, I think like if you're really serious in solving big problems on HPC, multi-level solvers are a fact of life. So well, how does it work? So I'm going to write down a linear equation, um, and the brackets will become obvious a bit later on. And I've got some current guess x hat. And the error between my current guess and the, uh, the actual solution is e, which has residual b minus a x hat. And so I just subtract a x hat from both sides of the equation. I end up with what's called the residual equation, so A of E is equal to the residual. And what's my plan for solving this? Well, I'm going to start on some, and I realize I'm using grid rather than mesh, but if I say grid, think mesh in your mind. So I'm going to start 
on a fine grid and I'm going to obtain some residual somehow. And then I'm going to restrict that residual and I'll tell you more about how I want to restrict this to a coarse grid, which is smaller. There are fewer degrees of freedom here. And then I'm going to solve the residual equation for the coarse error. So I'm going, to I'm going to invert a coarse operator and I'll talk about how to build that in a bit as well and hit that against the residual to get a coarse error. And then I'm going to prolong that correction to the fine grid and I can update the solution and I have a better solution on the fine grid. And so you can see, well, inverting AC is a bit easier than inverting A because the problem is smaller. But if you've got a really big problem, it doesn't help that much because it's not that much smaller. But so the components of the multigrid cycle sort of work like this, I think. So, for sm so there's smoothing. So it turns out you don't need to solve the problem that well on the fine grid. You just, in some sense, need to smooth the components of the error, which can't be represented on the coarse grid. Uh, and for some problems, this is easy. And for other problems, this is not so easy. So, OK, so I've got some error and I've smoothed it. That means that there are the high frequency components in it have gone. And now I'm going to transfer the residual, which is hopefully smooth on the fine grid, to the coarse grid. And now this smooth thing will look slightly coarser. And then after I've solved on the coarse grid somehow, I'll send the error correction back to the fine grid. And so I'll prolong that. And that will hopefully not introduce too many sort of low frequency smooth problems. And then I'll do core solve. So as I was saying, computing the inverse of this course operator directly isn't very feasible unless it's very small. And so what do I do? Well, I've got this two grid scheme that works. I can make the problem smaller. Now I'll make it smaller again by applying the two grid scheme recursively until I get to a problem that's small enough that I really can solve it easily. So I mean, so my, my, my feeling is that like a lot of multigrid is about getting your smoothers right. So your coarse grid is coarser. That's why it's a coarse grid. So some fine grid error modes will alias. So when I restrict, the, the coarse space is smaller. And so I have some modes in the fine space that will overlap when I go to the coarse space. Um, but if I've removed the high frequency modes, the alias, then I won't see them on the, on the coarse grid when I restrict because they weren't there on the fine grid to begin with. So I see a smooth error, but on the coarse grid it looks a bit jumpier so I can, uh, I can smooth it again. And then I do some prolongation and that sort of in some senses de-aliases the coarse grid modes a bit. It reintroduces some high frequency error and I'll need to smooth this out as well. Uh, so some smoothers, so if your problem is elliptic, point-wise is good. So this is something like SOR or Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel. If your problem is not elliptic or sort of partially elliptic or something, you need to inspect the problem in the literature and read lots. So you might want to do line smoothing. You might want to do local overlapping additive Schwartz smoothing, especially if you're in HDiv or HCurl. If you have flow problems, you might want to do some kind of like a Vanka-like smoothing where you do point block Jacobi on all sort of little coupled blocks of degrees of freedom and so on, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um. So I said you do this recursion. Oh, no, grid transfer. This. So I'm going to assume in this talk that I have embedded spaces because everything is really easy. So I want to transfer a residual. So here's a residual. I've got some, some function f, and I've integrated it against a test function that lives in the fine space. Um, but what I want is this. Uh, so I actually wanted to have that same function integrated, uh, integrated against a test function in the course space. Um, so, but notice that because we've got embedded spaces, the course test function does live in the fine space. And so what we do is we just write the course test function as a linear combination of the fine basis functions. And now the 
restriction is then just I take the fine residual and I apply some operator that does this linear combination and I get my coarse residual. Uh, you're embedded again, so prolongation is natural. Um, and it turns out that this tells you that the, prolonga the prolongator is just the transpose of the restriction operator. Um, you could do other things, but then your multigrid application will probably not be symmetric, which may be a problem if your problem was symmetric to start with and you want to maintain that it's symmetric. So here's, here's, uh, here's the slide I thought I was coming to. So the V-cycle, so, so notice how I said, like, so we do this two-grid thing and then we recursively do it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do some pre-smoothing, choosing an appropriate smoother, because I've read the literature right. And I'm going to restrict the residual a bit using this restriction operator. And I'm going to recurse on the coarse grid equations, which is AC is EC equals RC, to solve for EC. And then I'm going to go back down, prolonging the error updating, and then post-smoothing to remove these high-frequency alias, de-alias modes that I've somehow reintroduced. It's called a V-cycle because the thing looks like a V. So I'm going down, restricting, restricting the problem smaller. It becomes small enough that I can somehow solve it exactly. And then I go back, prolonging and post-smoothing on the way back. So the computational complexity. So you need, to, you, you need your coarse grids to sort of halve or like get smaller fast enough. I do a fixed number of smooths per level. And this thing can achieve discretization error in like order log n cycles, I think. And the cost is order n. I mean, this sum, this sum is bounded by 2 plus the cost of the coarse solve. But you hope that you get to a coarse enough grid that the coarse solve is order one, basically. Um, there are other cycle types. So you can do a W cycle. So every time you come back, you sort of like, you do two V cycles in some sense. And it's called a W cycle because it looks like a W. Um, and here, so we're doing. This is slightly, this is more expensive than a V cycle, but gets you closer, closer to the right answer a bit sooner. And, and finally, so the one that in the 80s everyone was really excited about as a direct solver is full multigrid, which you can achieve discretization error in order one cycles. And if you've got it slightly wrong, it's also somewhat more forgiving than V and W cycles. So what do I do here? So instead of starting at the fine grid, smoothing, getting some error, that I, I come all the way to the coarse grid straight away, solve the coarse equations exactly, and then use that prolonged as the guess for a sort of recursively increasing in size V cycle. If you get this right, this can be a very efficient solver. Yes? But, yeah. So, yeah. So, Mark's comment there, for those of you that didn't hear it, is like, so for a bunch of problems, you can prove that this gets you de discretization error in exactly one cycle. And I think, for those of you who are local, Mark is talking about multigrid tomorrow afternoon, and I think his abstract says he'll talk about this as well. So one of the questions you may be asking yourself is like, oh, well, this all sounds very complicated. Why am I, why am I not just using algebraic multigrid? Um, and well, there are very many reasons to use algebraic multigrid, because for many problems, it's black box, and you don't have to worry. You just have an assembled operator, and you hit go, and you maybe tweak a few parameters. And that's really good. And if you have, you might want to use gray box AMG, where you provide some extra information, but not everything. But they may not deal with some anisotropies. It might not exploit structure that's available in your problem. And you really need assembled operators, which sort of isn't great for the way modern hardware is going. So, like, so assembled matrices are really memory bandwidth bound, but modern hardware is giving you lots more flops, but not much more memory bandwidth. So. And another thing, so it turns out that you reformulate a bit, you can apply multigrid directly to nonlinear problems. So this is the uh, full approximation scheme idea. So what's the idea? So, well, notice the residual equation, which is ax minus ax hat, 
which is equal to the residual, is not equal to A of the error if A is nonlinear. So that means that we can't just apply the correction scheme multigrid that I was describing before directly to a nonlinear problem. So one approach you can do is you can do your normal Newton thing, and then you can do Newton Krylov or Newton multigrid or something. So you linearize and you use multigrid for the linear problem. The other thing is something called the full approximation scheme, where you apply multigrid directly. So I obtain some guess on the fine grid, and then I write the course exact solution as the error term plus this x hat. It's just rearranging the equation for the error. And then I solve for the full course equation with some sort of modified right hand side. So this isn't just the nonlinear equation ax equals residual. I've updated it with a restriction of the current guess with the course operator applied. And then I update the fine solution, prolonging the diff, like prolonging now this error term back. And this sort of bold R state injection need not be the same as residual restriction. So notice the things that you're pulling over live in different spaces. So in general, it might not be. Um, and Again, so if you do this right and you can get everything perfect, this can give you nice nonlinear solution of problems in the same amount of time as it does just to do a normal linear problem, if you get it right. So there are pros and cons. So we all love Newton because we've got like really like has quadratic convergence near roots. We've got lots of good theory on how to like solve things with Newton and so on. Also, I need to solve these linear problems, and there's lots of literature on how to solve these linear problems. I know how to do that as well, generally. I mean, on the downside, it requires a global linearization, which is maybe a synchronization point in a scalable algorithm. And if you're doing assembled matrices because you want to do Newton multigrid with algebraic, or assembled matrices are very helpful because they're nice and easy, you have high memory requirements and potentially low flop rates. On the flip side, so FAS gives you any linear convergence near roots. I mean, I don't know, maybe this is a false statement, but I feel like there's comparatively little theory on like convergence and so on. I mean, so there's one paper from Yavne about 2006 analyzing some things, but it's sort of suck it and see to a great extent. But if you do it right, you only need local linearization. So notice when I restrict, I just need to like solve this nonlinear problem again and if I can somehow, I mean, the ansatz is you do nonlinear smoothing. I mean, what does that really mean? Um, but if you can get it right, you only need local linearization, that's good. You don't need any assembled operators at all, so you've got lower memory requirements, and you have potentially higher flop rates. Um, but because there's sort of little theory, you don't know what's going to work for your problem. I think it's sort of, it, it's good if you can have like a test bed for trying things out easily and switching between these things. So okay, so moving a bit more towards implementation, I've got, sort of got a shopping list if I want geometric multigrid. So I want a hierarchy of grids. I want some transfer operators between them. I want some smoothers of some kind on each level, some coarse grid operators, and infrastructure for doing multigrid cycles. So what I have implemented so far is a nice regularly refined grid hierarchy because everything is easier if it's nested. And I said that this talk was without agonizing pain, and this was already with the nested things enough agonizing pain for me. Um, for grid transfer, well, again, I was saying it's easy for nested spaces. So the residual restriction via embedding, because the fine basis spans the course, we just write the, fine ba the course basis functions as a weighted sum of a few fine basis functions. Prolongation can be the transpose. State restriction I want to inject, so drop fine degrees of freedom if I'm continuous, or at cell average if I'm discontinuous, sort of finite volume -y. Course grid operators, well, I'm doing this all in a sort of Phoenix-like environment, so I have UFL giving me the variational form so I can just re-discretize from them. The alternative is like a variation or Gilerkin operator where the course operator is defined as you prolong, you apply the fine grid, and then you restrict again. 
And this can be more robust in the face of discontinuities and variable coefficients, but again, it might, your mileage might vary, so it's useful to be able to switch between these two options. Uh, so the cycle infrastructure and the smoothers, well, Firebreak is already very, very heavily Petsy reliant. So Petsy already gives you configurable multigrid via PC type MG and FAS via SNES type FAS. So we just use that. And callbacks for the assembly go via shell DMs for auto magic. This means we can use all the full suite of Petsy solvers as smoothers. So if, if it turns out that like you think you've got everything working, but you don't have a good smoother, well, you can just do something. You can do a like, really heavy thing. You can just do Krylov and like, do GM res with like, lots of ILU to just see if, like, see if multigrid could work if you could come up with a good smoother. So the mesh hierarchy. So regular nested refinement makes things easy, so that's a good place to start. So you can do costing, but this may affect convergence properties. So for example, Peter, Bruna, Matt, and Ridge, I think, show how to do this for node-nested coarsening. And there's a nice paper in CISC from about 2013. Matt and Jared are, I believe, working on unnested coarsening. Um, and I don't know if this will work. But I mean, it's worth a try, isn't it? Because if you could do unnested coarsening, then like, that would be really great. Um, the, yes. So most of the work I did was basically glue. So Firedrake lives here, and it has a solver, and that has some SNES, which is Pepsi scalable nonlinear something or other solvers. Um, and they communicate by something called a DM shell. So if I'm doing, say, Newton multigrid, the SNES will linearize, have a multigrid preconditioner. It'll want to build some coarse Jacobians. It'll want to know how to restrict and prolong. But Pepsi doesn't know this, so it has to sort of call back to Firedrake to do that. And the way you provide all this information through these hierarchies is through these DMs that know sort of how the data is managed. Um, this kind of infrastructure is if you're doing sort of block preconditioning, you need it for some matrix formats. If you don't have the right block size and variable discretization, that you can just sort of do it using Pepsi options. So grid transfers, so the kernel to perform transfers for the restriction, you basically just do dual basis evaluation. So you take you, the weights for the coarse basis functions are just the fine basis functions evaluated at the coarse, coarse grid points. And an actual transfer is just a walk over the mesh. So we do this matrix free for now, which means that I, couldn't do, I can't currently do the Gilurkin operators that I was telling you was a good idea to be doing for some things. And also for low order, the assembled restrict and prolong are likely better. But anyway, so the prolongation at the moment looks something like this. So you take a coarse function, no, a fine, yeah, a coarse function to the fine thing by doing a loop over the mesh with some kernel looping over the cells and writing and reading. Rediscretizing, well, UFL uses sort of I use this UFL multifunction transformer to visit the form and replace things. Normal calls to assemble work transparently, so everything's good. I mean, so I have a sort of slightly, it's slightly difficult here. So like Python level forms contain all the mesh specific data. And so is there a sort of clean way to separate these things so that I can use the same form on different levels and pass the coefficients in separately? And I don't know. And I don't know if that's even like the best thing to do. Um, the API, so this is what I would sort of like to see. So I build a mesh somehow, I build a hierarchy, I maybe select the finest hierarchy, build a function space there and some functions, and I build some nonlinear residual, and then I say solve, and I just pass some options asking me for a multigrid solver. Um, people have better ideas, I'm open to them. Um, so I don't know, so I mean, so I've specified the mesh hierarchy hierarchy up front here, if I'd done some kind of adaptive refinement, that might sort of have to be hidden somehow, I don't know. What I have looks much uglier. So I build a mesh hierarchy, I have to build a function space hierarchy, a function hierarchy, select the finest level objects, build a nonlinear variational problem, and then a hierarchy of nonlinear variational solvers, and pass the options in. Um, 
So yeah, so I think that this is much less friendly. So a lower level API, so allow users to do things by hand. So if they want to write their own multi-grid cycles, if they want to hook into different things, provide maybe differently scaled boundary conditions on the different levels. So grid transfer as well. It's pretty simple. Hierarchy customization. Well, if you just give me one problem, I can coarsen it and rediscretize. If you instead provide a list of problems, I'll just use them one by one. Um, so I'm always rediscretizing, as I said, because I'm doing the restriction and prolongation matrix free. And the solver configuration, so control the solvers I do via Pepsi options because I'm really disinclined to try and bolt something on top that I have to keep on ins extending. I mean, it, I would say it gets hairy very fast. And uh, Matt occasionally shows slides where it's already, I think, gotten far too hairy, but there we go. Passing information via DMs means all the composability that's in, I think, the 2013 Brown, Bruner, and Smith paper on like composable nonlinear solvers is already there. So you can do Newton preconditioned with FAS. You can do like composite nonlinear solves where you're switching additively or multiplicatively between two different things. Um, so it's it's quite a nice playground for sort of working with these things because you don't have to worry about getting your variational problem right. You've already got your solver not on a hierarchy. So summary, I think, so I've got to the end, maybe a bit early, but there's time for discussion. So mostly I say everything just works, so for simple things you can do it really fast. For more complicated things you probably have to think more. The interface could certainly do with some polishing and I'm open to suggestions. There's no silver bullet anywhere. So if you want to do complicated things you need to work harder at it. Um, but I think it's pretty straightforward to build an experiment with multi-level solvers to see if they're going to fit your problem and could be easy to get going. On the wish list, lots of things, multi-grid inside field split blocks, as I say, Gilurkin course operators. We don't have support, good support for the like the sort of strong nonlinear sm smoothers. So I mean, so you can do nonlinear Gauss Seidel, but it needs assembled matrices because but I think it should be possible to write sort of matrix-free nonlinear gauss seidel in a generic way. Oh, it's that. Okay. Cool. Uh, nonlinear additive Schwartz. I need to do some quite a bit of work, I think. Uh, matrix-free. I need operator diagonals, so I can do at least some kind of preconditioning. Hierarchy from coarse meshes, semi-coarse names, so on. Some, some pointers. So as I say, Mark Adams is giving two multi-grid talks tomorrow from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. So in the Grantham boardroom, if you're still here and you're interested in multi-grid some more. So the first one is another multi-grid primer where he's going through a bunch of sort of asymptotic theory and so on. And the second one is talking about a very nice technique called segmental refinement for low memory, high flop rate multi-grid. Uh, Aki Brandt's multigrid guide, I would say, is somewhat polemic, but it is quite good. Um, it does go through a lot of things that you can do if you get everything right. Here's this paper that sort of analyzes some multi-level nonlinear grids with some analysis of convergence. If you want to debug your linear multigrid solver, this is a very nice paper to follow. And if you want to do non-nested spaces, all the restrictions and prolongations get a bit harder. So, for example, here's one where they talk about non-conforming for Stokes and restriction and prolongation and so on, and it all seems to work. And with that, I'm done, so thank you very much. And the only thing I would like to do at this point is to thank David for doing all the organizing. Uh, I have not, I mean, that's, that sounds like a nice idea. I don't know quite how it would work.
Yeah, my voice is gone. So Boyce assembles uh, stuff in IBAMR. IBAMR is this immersed boundary AMR code. And they'll assemble large blocks and do multiplicative. So right, what works in parallel right now is multiplicative on the subdomain, additive across subdomains. And it seems to converge very well for, for those immersed boundary fluid problems. So I think that's your sledgehammer smoother, like big block MSM locally. And then you can do, if it's cheap, you can do the uh, matrix-free nonlinear gauss Seidel, except that is got a constant that's the number of colors that we can do. So there's a hook where you can write your own if you know your operator. That's much faster. And that's what Peter did for the paper. But in general, you'll just accept that factor of seven or whatever. Um, or you'll, or, yeah. All right. So nonlinear gauss Seidel says, I will solve this one equation and then this one equation and then this one equation. So what we do is we color the mesh and we solve all of the, uh, the colors that are uh, independent, like all of one color we solve at once. And, it, and you just run through the unknowns and you do a little finite difference approximation of the one dimensional J Jacobian and update. And, and so you have, you have a serialization on the number of colors. And you could potentially do better because you could not loop over the entire mesh when you did your residual valuation. You could break up the mesh into the part of the mesh that was only the color and save yourself time. And if it was colored in a nice way, that's, that's an important <coughs> factor. So eventually, Patrick will make me do that. Yes. Yeah. Why do you color? What do you, what do you color? Why do you color? Well, you, you color what, what all it tells you is uh, which uh, equations can be evaluated independently. They don't interact uh, to first order. Yeah. That's what I, so that's where there's a hook and you can provide your own nonlinear gauss Seidel and that would be way better. That would be better, like, to the tune of 10x, right? Yeah. Yep. And so, yeah, you, you should be, that's one, okay, so that's a thing where UFL really matters, right? You could, you could generate your nonlinear gauss Seidel uh, iteration from the form, and that would be, a pretty good smoother, yeah. And oh, I guess, like yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. So, yeah. Comments. Um, well, first, that was an excellent. Um, that was an excellent primer and introduction to multigrid. You've you've learned well. Uh, you've you've read the right things and and done your homework. Um, let me just mention that, uh, like. The, as far as the history of multigrid, that actually Southwell here in the 30s okay. did some something that you could call was a had multigrid ideas in it, and Fred Aranko sort of pushed that forward a little bit further, but they were both very different than what we see today, and the costs were. I mean, Aki told me that it was like four orders of magnitude slower than you know textbook multigrid today. It was a very different thing. So Aki really figured out. Yeah. the way to do it right um, and it made it you know it made it from something that was theoretically interesting to something that is obviously very practically interesting um, and um, also mentioned that for uh, for F cycles you might want I know Barry would probably hit me because he likes to have everything in pet C but you might want to do your F cycles your yourself because that would let you control adaptivity for example um, because then you start the nice thing about full multigrid well there's two or, there's two nice things one is that it provides good globalization for your nonlinear solver because you start from a coarse grid and you know people call it you know nested iterations and there's a thousand names for this this idea of getting a coarse grid approximation to you know help your your nonlinear solver so it really helps globalization of your nonlinear solver but it's also very natural for adaptivity because you start at the course grid and so you don't need to know how many grids you're going to end up with when you start 
Um, and if everything's really working well, you've got, got really textbook multigrid v-cycle, then in fact you will have truncation error accuracy um, at the end of one f-cycle. And I'll talk a little bit to tomorrow about analysis for that and how you can sort of see why that happens and, and, and so on. Why can't we do multigrid inside field split blocks? Oh, Does I haven't happen? hooked it up right, so I can't give you the operator. Oh, okay. Oh, if you implement... Yeah, I know yeah. what I need to do. I haven't done okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. What changes when we do 3D atmospheric stuff? How Okay, so the context for this is you want to solve, like, an... HDiv L2 Helmholtz, nice Helmholtz, on a really thin shell domain. And the problem here is that, so one of the ways you do it is you do the sure complement, but the thing that looks morally like a Helmholtz operator now is in the sure complement and not in the, not in like, so you have a, like, you have an HDiv mass matrix and it's strongly vertically coupled, so you need to do like basically like, in column exact factorization that way. You know, Toby put that in GAMG. Did you see that? You could yeah. tell it the columns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, and so now you need to, so now you precondition on the outside, you do your sure complement, and you do, and you need to get like the good smoothing so you have nice multigrid efficiency for the sure complement, but everything inside there is like, a, like you've got a mass inverse for every action, so you don't really have an assembled operator, so that makes things a bit messy. Um, so Eike Müller, who is at Bath, has been using this framework to try and do matrix-free multigrid, so he tries to cook up some kind of approximations to the inverse mass that's good enough that you get nice nice convergence and it and you get nice convergence but it's much slower than we would like and we don't really know where why do you want to do it on the sure complement instead of the f whole problem why don't you just you know use a block smoother like we do for stokes instead of sure yeah so the uh, yeah so the other thing you can do is then you can do like a div div yeah. on the uh and that should work, but you need the right subdomains, and I haven't got that yet. Yeah, yeah. So I think the right thing to do there, if you're doing geometric, is uh, Doug Arnold's, the 2007 or something, multigrid and HDiv papers. So you do little additive Schwartz blocks that are defined by the connectivity of the vertices in the mesh, and they're overlapping. Or you could do right. auxiliary space. Doing the small blocks is easy, I think. I think we can do that. So I've got a question. Back to your yeah. Oh, one way. Uh, I think this is really just following up on, on your comments. But, uh, I guess my question is Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And then one question I guess to ask is to what extent could you rather than go So, Are you accusing the, um, the PETI interface of not being a thing of beauty? Did I say that? <laughs> I mean, okay, so... Did I say that? <laughs> so, so the question is, is sort of like, could PETI or other big solver libraries expose a sort of more composable algebraic interface? Um, 
Um, okay, so I, I don't know. So I mean, so I think actually, I mean, it's maybe a little bit difficult to program and get your head around, but I think for the, like, the, the abstract interface for linear operators and nonlinear operators in Petsy and the way the fields decompose, I think is pretty well thought out. And I think it is well, quite a composable. I'm not saying that. I'm certainly not saying it's not well thought out. I'm just saying here's another way. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, I, I would think anybody who's thought about automated computing has written out an abstract conjugate gradient solver and an abstract Euclid solver. That's sort of. Officially hard question here, and, and this is, and, and like multigrid really shows this up because multigrid is just an exercise in composing lots of things together. And so I, I think what you're really pushing at is, ah, but the user then has to actually do an entire page full of things that start with hyphen hyphen PC. And, and that's where it, it's a problem. You're saying, could we have something algebraic there? I, I'm not sure what the algebra would look like that would. Be immediately capture that in quite the same way. I, I know where you're coming from because what is there now is horrible, but I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the nice answer to that is. So could you, so, I mean, could you have something sort of flame-like? Exactly, exactly. And let me just say one of the reasons I'm asking this question is that there are two things. I don't think I know how to do the construction interface better than we do now. Certainly, I could imagine that you'd have a declarative language and it would be easier to set up complicated solves. But our most, our, the, the, the part of Petsy that's the worst, that's, the, that's holding us back the most, is, um, is the ability to uh, customize inside of deep hierarchies. And this, is, this pertains to FireDrake because it's something you want to do. So suppose what you want to do is let's say you want to solve Stokes, okay? So you have you say I know an optimal, I know a preconditioner that's H independent. I make A and I make the mass matrix and I put them in another matrix and I give Petsy both of them. Okay, fine. In order to give it both of them, you sort of have to know where that solve is. So I can make operators, but I want to get the auxiliary operator that I'm making to the right place. Now, what if instead what you said is, well, I actually have a nonlinear problem. And, oh, instead of a nonlinear problem, I'll, I'll, I'll use that nonlinear solver as a preconditioner for another nonlinear problem. And by that time, you're like, oh, and on the inside, when I linearize, I know I have Stokes and I want to put the mass matrix there in the right place. That's difficult now. There, uh, there's no good way to say, I know the kind of solve that I want to customize. And it may be at the bottom of deep hierarchy, and it may be in the fact that sometimes I use multigrid, so in the smoother I'm doing Stokes, sometimes I do blocks on the outside and I use multigrid to do the blocks, so I, I've customized there. So it could be that the, the DAG or tree or whatever you have for the solver is, is very different for the same code, and it could be because of machine characteristics, it could be because of the point, the flow that you're in, it could be because it's on the inside of an optimization this time and I don't need enough, uh, I don't need as much fidelity. There's a lot of different reasons for doing this, good reasons for not putting it in your code. But if it's not in your code, how do you tell it on some kind of outside, like options or Python or something that's easily changed, how do you tell it, go down to the place that I know I want to be and give it this auxiliary operator that I made? It's, that's hard. And then people would actually use that information to make their plans for the next year. And so uh, anyway, I just thought I'd make that comment for people who have not really been to very many Phoenix meetings where it's gotten to be more just giving lectures. But this used to be the core of, of what we did, was just ha hash out these 
ideas for the future. Well, anyway, let's call it uh, to a close and, and thank David one more time for putting on such a great meeting.